The United States, Japan possesses the inestimable value of being one of the most advanced countries in the world with great technological and potentially military sophistication, as well as a congenital fear of China. The United States has been trying hard to persuade Japan to play a more active military and diplomatic role in both East Asia and globally. We are witnessing the emergence of two competing visions of the region. China's vision is of East Asia with China at its center and the United States slowly but increasingly marginalized. Japan's is of Asia Pacific rather than East Asia with the United States and Japan forming the central axis. The East Asian story ever since the end of the Vietnam War has been an economic story. That is how the region has seen itself. That has been its overwhelming preoccupation during a long period of relative peace. And that is how the rest of the world have come to regard East Asia. The East Asian story over the next few days, a few decades, is likely to be rather different. With the rise of new tensions and conflicts, the return of history, as witnessed in the anti-Japanese anti demonstrations in China this time last year, and the growing resurgence of nationalism. The key reason for this change is the rise of China, which is and will oblige every country to reevaluate and reorientate its foreign policy, in the majority of cases towards a closer relationship with China, the emergent new power broker in the region. The most likely exception is Japan. Indeed, Japan's attitude poses a very serious problem for China, arguably much more serious than Taiwan. It's extremely difficult to see relations improving. On the contrary, they're likely to continue to deteriorate as Japan adopts, for various reasons, a more nationalist position. And there is already a ready-made flashpoint, namely offshore oil and gas. And uh, now it would appear, the last 12 months, uh, uh, several times, uh, the, the, this issue has involved sharp exchanges between the two countries. The outcome of these regional relationships will, in important measure, determine the extent of China's influence at a global level. The more fraught China's relationships at a regional level prove to be, the more difficult it will be for China to emerge as a global power. Which brings me to my penultimate theme, a different kind of modernity. The penultimate question, and arguably the most important of all, concerns the nature of Chinese modernity. Hitherto, with the exception of Japan, all examples of modernity have been Western, embracing two different models, namely American and European, though often they are wrongly conflated into one Western model. However, it is also the case that they share some fundamental characteristics, not surprisingly given the fact that the United States was a product of European migration. Japan, of course, does not belong to this Western tradition, but it has always sought to play down the distinctive nature of its modernity to the external world. As a, role, as a result, the significance and achievement of Japanese modernity has never, in my view, received the recognition that it deserves. And the world has, for the most part, been able largely to ignore the fact. That will not be possible with China. China will simply be too big and too powerful to be overlooked. Moreover, these are different times. When Japan started its industrialization, it was isolated. Today, China is surrounded by countries that are further down the modernization trail than it is, with India not too far behind as well. This is an era pregnant with new, diverse, non-Western modernities. China is not alone. We are entering a new era where, for the first time since industrialization began over two centuries ago, modernity will be plural rather than singular, culturally diverse rather than overwhelmingly Western. And China is inevitably the most important example of such a new kind of modernity. The West likes to think of modernity in a singular way. The world, including China, is all headed in the same direction and will converge on one model of modernity, the Western. It will not happen. But nor will the simple obvious. Chinese modernity, like the other new ones, will be a hybrid, drawing on Western modernity, of course, maybe a little Japanese, but also at the same time rooted in its own history and culture. The emergence of Chinese modernity as a new phenomenon within the global firm will have profound repercussions for people across the world. How they conceive of the future, the choices open to them, and the influences that are brought to bear. In effect, modernity 
for the first time will be contested. So what will the parameters, uh, what will be the, the parameters of Chinese modernity? What factors uh, will shape it? Well, this is a big question, <laughs> uh, but uh, partly by way of summarizing some of the things I've said, um, and partly by introducing new things, I, I thought it would be worthwhile having a stab at what um, are the kind of factors and circumstances which will shape Chinese modernity. First, uh, time compressed modernity, not distinct to China, shared by the Asian Tigers, and a result of the extraordinary speed of its economic takeoff when compared with the Western experience. And all these are instances, compared with the Western experience, especially compared with the European experience, the past, the present, and the future are juxtaposed in the present in a way that is quite new, quite new uh, with very uh, important implications. Um, secondly, and I won't go on about this because I've said, talked about it, developed and developing country. Thirdly, the legacy of colonialism, Western and Japanese, and the profound sense of humiliation that the Chinese feel about it. Uh, next, China as the center of a new kind of East Asian economy, the possible recomposition in a modern context of the old Chinese tributary system. I think also a continental rather than global minded out. This continental orientation is likely to influence and shape its global ambitions. A relatively non militaristic history concerned with the extension and subsequent defense of its own vast borders rather than non continental, non -continental expansionary ambitions. As I said earlier, the Middle Kingdom mentality combining a sense of the superiority of Chinese civilization and history with the Han Chinese racial identity. An extremely long history, this has generated a very distinctive historically minded culture with many distinct characteristics. You've only got to watch mainland Chinese television to see the importance of history in the soaps, which would be inconceivable in a Western country. They're all, they were virtually all historical soaps. <laughs> well, it's true, not just true in China, but it's true, it's true, um, it's true in um, a number of countries in three regions especially with a large Chinese population. I, uh, my next point, oh, I didn't manage to, sorry. A, a, a Chinese, a Chinese civilization, uh, sorry, my next point, a civilization masquerading as a culture, masquerading as a nation state. In terms of governance, networks, and diversity, China should be seen as a continent rather than a nation state. And that, in that sense, I think it will introduce far more novelty European Union, to think in those terms. Society, a society organized in dense networks descended from the intensive agrarian model, including the pivotal importance of the extended family reinforced by ancestral worship. 